This is the lecture for Bernard Williams' The Truth in Relativism. So here we have Williams uh, right here. And so uh, the lecture starts off with, what it says, an apology and three excuses. So the apology is, this is a very difficult article to read. And of course, we've had lots and lots of difficult things to read in this course. But, you know, the hope is that in the second part of the course, after we finish the historical stuff, the hope is that it gets a bit easier to read but uh, this, I think, is still tough because uh, both the content is very difficult and also the way of writing is uh, maybe not super clear. So, uh, for instance, here's a random sentence. Um, it may be that some forms of relativism can be shown to be false by reference to these presuppositions themselves, not on the ground which would prove nothing, that the genesis of ideas, such as a culture, like that of relativism itself, lies in a certain sort of culture, but on the ground that the application of a notion of such, a, of such, a, such as a culture presupposes the instantiation in the subject matter of a whole set of relations which can be adequately expressed at all only via the concepts of one culture rather than another, for instance, certain notions of causality. So uh, this sentence is a bit longer than maybe you would hope to see, and it's a very complicated construction. So uh, I would suggest take this very slow. So um, that's the apology, but then so three sort of excuses for why why this. So number one, uh, look, uh, reading hard stuff is good for you. Uh, the more practice you get with it, the better you get at it. You know, I'm at the point where I can just read this like I read anything else. It makes perfect sense to me. So, you know you want to get there someday, that would be nice. Uh, no matter whether you read more philosophy or no matter what you do in the rest of your life, the better you get at reading complicated things, the better things will go for you. So uh, now is some time to practice. Number two, um, the, so he's, his style of difficult writing is uh, different from a lot of the uh, writing styles we've seen so far. And some people I think will find it very interesting or um, it's like an appealing way of doing philosophy, both the way he writes and also just the complicated ideas that he sets up. Uh, what he does is he sort of sets up a structure and then applies it, and we'll talk a bit about this in the lecture. Um, and so you might just find this to be an interesting article itself. Uh, and so that's the second reason. And the third reason, the biggest reason, is that luckily, worst case scenario, if you cannot make any sense of this article, it is just too complicated, uh, that's fine, because the sort of the central point is actually pretty easy to explain to you, so that's what I'm going to do in this lecture. So this won't be a wasted article for you because you can still get the important idea from me right now in here, even if you can't get it reading the article. So that's okay. So what is this lecture going to do? Uh, the rest of the lecture is going to give you the central idea of the paper. And as I say in the outline up above, you'll get the very simple version and then the simple version. So the very simple version, I'm just going to say in words right now, it's not written up here, it's just I'm going to explain it. So what we're interested in is moral relativism and whether moral relativism is true. What is relativism? So relativism is the idea that, look, uh, you, there are sort of different sets of moral truths that are equally true. Or, in other words, uh, there's not one common morality that's shared by everybody. There are different sorts of moralities, at least two. Uh, you know, there's probably more than two if the relativist is right. But if the relativist is right, there are at least two, and maybe more. And they are relative to some certain context. So maybe they're relative to different places. So maybe in India, there's one morality and in Botswana, there's another morality. Maybe they're relative to certain times. So maybe there's one morality right now, and then 600 years ago, they had a different morality. Maybe they're relative to cultures, or religions, or people. Maybe each individual has their own morality. And you might think, well, obviously moral, or you can, and of course, you can combine all of these, or combine different versions. And you might think, look, obviously moral relativism is true. Everybody's got a different moral code. But no, we're interested in uh, not whether people sort of have moral differences, but whether they their moral differences are correct or justified 
whether there's sort of one true moral code, and we can judge all the moral codes against it, and they can be right or wrong, or whether there are multiple true moral codes. So that's the sort of question of moral relativism. And the way Williams specifically wants to think about it is, uh, are there any sorts of moral codes that uh, kind of can't talk with each other, or you can't really choose between the two of them? So there's no basis on which to say one is better than the other. So if there's no way to say one moral code is better than another moral code, we'll have to accept that relativism is true about morality. They're both sort of equally good or equally bad, or really they're both just equal because good and bad are moral terms and we can't really use those to judge. There's not like one right answer. They're just different. They're separate, they're different, and there's nothing more to say about them beyond they're different. So is that true? And Williams is going to say yes. There are different moral codes. Why? Uh, he's, he's basically just going to say it. He just says, look, think about certain moral codes. They are simply just different from yours. They're not better or worse. It just doesn't make sense to judge them, morally speaking. They're just so far away they're just, it's so impossible for you to even imagine what it would be like to accept that moral code that it's just too different for there to be any kind of judgment from your part on their part and from them to you. So if there can't be any judgment, if you can't say that moral code is better or worse than mine, it's all I can say is that it's different, then relativism is true. There isn't like one true morality or one true moral standard that we can rank all the moral codes with. Rather, there's just different moral codes, and there's nothing more we can say. So that's the very simple version of Williams. What's his argument for it? I mean, again, <laughs> the argument is just saying it, and then you're supposed to find it compelling. But then he wrote this 14-page article, so what exactly is going on here? So here's the simple version of what's going on in this article. So we start off with the question, relativism and specifically moral relativism. So he's interested in is uh, placing certain issues in the discussion of relativism, not to deal with any of them thoroughly. So he just wants to sort of bring up some things related to relativism. It's concerned with any kind of relativism in the sense that the questions raised are ones that should be asked with regard to relativistic views in any area, whether it be the worldviews of different cultures, shifts in scientific paradigms, or differences in ethical outlook. So that story I just told about moral relativism, you could also have that view about shifts in scientific paradigms. So we have a bunch of different scientific paradigms, a bunch of different scientific theories. Are, and are, is there one standard which we can judge them all with? Or are they just different theories and we can't say one is better than another? They're incompatible with each other and there's no basis on which to choose one or the other. If there's no basis to choose, if there's just a bunch of different theories and you can't pick one as better than the other, then you are a scientific relativist. Or similarly, worldviews of different cultures. So, you know, maybe there's a bunch of different worldviews. Are any of them correct or incorrect? Can we choose on the basis of, like, whether they match correctness or not? No. There's just different worldviews, and there's nothing more to say. So you could be a cultural worldview relativist. So he says, I'm going to sort of construct a framework that works for all of these. A machinery is introduced, which is intended to apply quite generally. So he's going to construct a framework. But the only area in which I want to claim that there is truth in relativism is the area of ethical relativism. This doesn't mean that I here try to argue against its truth in any other area, nor blah, blah, blah. So he's not saying scientific relativism is false or true. He's not saying worldviews of culture, relativism, false or true, whatever. He's just going to say ethical relativism is true. So that's the only argument he's going to give here. And as I noted, he's not really going to argue for it. He's just going to state it. But he's going to give us a framework that works for all relativisms and then say that it's true, like this framework describes relativism in ethics. So remember, before when I gave the three excuses, I said one of the interesting things is sort of the method that he's going through. So this is kind of an interesting way of doing philosophy. He's going to construct a sort of framework for dealing with relativism and then apply it to ethics. And so um, 
we see a way in which more general concerns about philosophy can be applied in one specific place, which is ethics, which we haven't seen a ton of. We saw a bit of it in Kant, we saw some of it in Aristotle, we saw a tiny bit in Mill, um, and, but yeah, so this is a way of doing things. So that's the question, relativism, and his answer is yes when it comes to moral relativism. So what's, how do, what he, does he go about saying? So he says, look, think about relativism in terms of different systems of belief. So we have one system of belief and another system of belief, and maybe like seven or 12 or 100 or whatever. And imagine we have confrontations between these systems of belief. Now, a confrontation is not like a fight. They're not like attacking each other. It's not that kind of confrontation. Confrontation just means they're sort of, they're both before us. Uh, they're sort of both on the table. They're both, uh, we're sort of judging between them. We're sort of deciding between them. We have to, we have to look at them both in the same light, in the same context. We, we're sort of confronted with both of them or they're confronting each other in the sense that uh, it is time now for judgment. It is time to decide between these or to rank them or whatever. And so you can see how this sort of confrontation of different systems of belief would be relevant to the question of relativism because the question of relativism is when there's confrontation like this, does, does one of the belief systems win out? Is there like a correct one? Or is there just nothing to say here? Are they just, they're on a par and there's nothing to say when they confront each other. So if relativism is true, then we have two systems and there's nothing to say between them. If objectivism is true, then there is something to say. One of these systems is correct, or maybe they're both correct, or maybe they're both wrong, but there's like something we can say. And the way he's gonna articulate this is by coming up with the, uh, he's gonna divide confrontations into two kinds of categories. There are real confrontations between systems of belief, and there are merely notional, or we might call them nominal, confrontations between systems of belief. So what's the difference between a real confrontation and a notional confrontation? So a real confrontation between systems of belief is when both of the systems of belief are sort of real options for us, or real options for the people in the systems of belief. So imagine I have one system of belief that says uh, it's great to eat potatoes in the morning, and another system of belief that says it's great to eat potatoes or tomatoes at night. So these are two systems of belief, and we have a confrontation between them. Are they both real options? Number one, yes, I think I can, I mean, not number one, like, yes, they seem like real options. Number one, I can, I can adopt either of those. In fact, I can adopt both. They're compatible with each other. There's no conflict there. So a confrontation between them is a real confrontation in the sense that I can imagine choosing between them. I can pick one or the other. And in fact, I don't have to choose. I can pick both. So those are both real options for me. So when both are real options for me, when I can sort of imagine or when it, it's, it's not about imagining, when it's possible for me to endorse both of the systems of belief, then we have a real confrontation. A merely notional confrontation is when one or both systems of belief are not real options, like I couldn't adopt this system of belief. So what would this look like? It can be a little hard to get examples because to get, I will forget why it's hard to get examples. Just say there is some system of belief that you absolutely could not adopt. There's just no way you could ever change yourself to adopt that system of belief if you don't have it already. Of course, if you have it already, it's got to be a real option. So we're only talking now about systems of belief you don't have. Maybe, I mean, so this is potentially false, but let's just assume it's true. Let's assume religions are, uh, there can only be notional confrontation between religions. So let's assume religion relativism. So then let's say you have a Christian and a Jew. You have the Christian system of belief and the Jewish system of belief. And just imagine that the Christian system of belief is not an option for the Jew, and the Jewish system of belief is not an option for the Christian. There, there's just nothing they could do to change their religion. Now, again, that's probably false, but like, imagine it were true. Imagine there were nothing they could do. That would be a notional confrontation. It would be a real confrontation if they could change their religions, if there were options there. Now, 
what do we say about confrontations between systems of belief? We can have confrontations between scientific systems of belief, ethical systems of belief, <clears throat> religious systems of belief, and so on. What do we say? William says, take ethical systems of belief, the kind we're interested in in this course. So, I don't know, utilitarianism and Kantianism or something, but probably actual systems of belief that normal people have. If there's a real confrontation between these two, in those circumstances, moral terms, moral judgments make sense. So imagine you have a utilitarian and a Kantian, and it's possible for the utilitarian to change their mind to become a Kantian. It's possible for the Kantian to change their mind to become a utilitarian. This is a real confrontation. There's a real live possibility here that they could swap if they decided to. So if it's possible to change, then Williams thinks it's possible to have a sort of moral dialogue between these two systems. Utilitarianism can say, oh, Kantianism is bad for X, Y, Z. It's morally objectionable for these reasons. Like, here are my moral objections to Kantianism. And Kantianism can say, oh, utilitarianism is bad for these reasons. It doesn't respect the goodwill, it blah, blah, blah. So when you have a real confrontation, moral discussion, moral terms make sense. We can morally judge the different theories compared to each other, the different systems of belief compared to each other. So that's perfectly fine. Williams thinks, in that case, you don't have relativism. When you have two systems of belief that are in real confrontation, there's no relativism because one or the other could maybe win out. Maybe there's a sort of standard we're using to judge, and maybe Kantianism wins, or maybe utilitarianism wins, or maybe neither should win, something else should win. So when there's a real confrontation, when there's a real choice to be made, relativism doesn't make sense. However, when you have notional confrontation, or merely notional confrontation, when one or the other or both systems are not real options for you, that is when moral terms don't make sense. So, I mean, again, it's hard to come up with examples. So the example he uses, um, he uses a few examples, but one example he uses of a, is a Bronze Age Greek chieftain, or the, the society, the, no, let's find it. Uh, well, it's not, basically. So, uh, Imagine the moral system of a Bronze Age Greek chieftain. So I don't know when the Bronze Age is, but sometime BCE, a long, long time ago, a very different context from the one you're living in right now. Could you adopt that moral system? Is that a real option for you? And Williams thinks the answer is no. And <laughs> it's just, no, you're, there's nothing about that system that would be even the, the sort of thing you could ever live your life according to. That's just no longer an option for really anybody, but especially not you or me. We just could not have that moral system. And similarly, it works in the other direction. Whatever our moral system is, or whatever your moral system is, or whatever my moral system is, these are not real options for the Bronze Age Greek chieftain. It's just, there, there's no real confrontation here between these two systems of belief. The Bronze Age Greek chieftain could not uh, live according to, you know, whatever moral theory, whatever moral system of belief you're living according to. So Williams thinks these cases, notional confrontations between moral systems, there's no moral judgment that can go on. So you can't look at the Greek system of belief, moral system of belief, and say, oh, it's morally bad or something. These terms just don't make sense. It's just too far away for it to make sense for you to like judge the Greek using moral terms. Like those terms just don't apply to something that far away, something that's not a real option. You can't say, oh, you know, this moral system would be better in these ways and worse in these other ways, or my moral system is better because of equity. It's just the comparison doesn't even make sense. It's across too far a distance. And he says this is the truth in relativism. This is the true form of ethical relativism. When there are two options and one or both are not real options, then you have moral relativism. Because there's no standard to judge between the two. You're stuck with yours, and the Greek is stuck with his, and they can't change. You can't adopt the Greek one, the Greek can't adopt yours. And so moral relativism is true about, for instance, your moral system or my moral system versus 
the Greeks' moral system. There's no judgment to be made here. There's just separate systems, and that's all we can say. They're both sort of on their own. They're both equally true in the sense that truth, like truth doesn't even make sense. They're just separate. There's no judgment between the two. So how common is this kind of relativism? For instance, is Kantian and utilitarianism, are these real confrontations or notional confrontations? Uh, maybe if you and I have different moral systems, are these real? Can we have a real confrontation or is this a notional confrontation? Williams doesn't say. He doesn't say how widespread moral relativism is. His point is just that there is some. So like he thinks very long ago, those moral systems, those are just obviously too different. Certainly moral relativism is true about that. But what about today between different societies or even between different people? He doesn't say. It's up to you, maybe, to make a judgment about how widespread this kind of relativism is. But Williams does give you a tool for figuring out whether how widespread it is. He says, when you have two systems, one of which or both of which are not real options, that is when relativism comes in. So if you have ethical systems and you ever find an ethical system that's not a real option, relativism is therefore true about that one when compared to at least your ethical system, because yours must be a real option for you. So that's a test for sort of finding the scope of relativism. And that's his argument. And he thinks one nice thing about his description version of moral relativism is that it is not vulgar relativism. What is vulgar relativism? Well, vulgar relativism is the view which combines a relativistic account of the meaning or content of ethical terms with a non-relativistic principle of toleration. So the thought is, on the one hand, the vulgar relativist says, oh, you know, what's right or wrong is relative to typically societies or cultures. So what's right for somebody in a certain culture is whatever their culture says is right. What's wrong is whatever their culture says is wrong. And different cultures judge differently. So one culture says this is right, another culture says this is wrong, and there's, there's just, they're both right. You know, this culture is right about its moral truths, this culture is right about its moral truths, everybody has their own moral truths and that's okay. So they say that, and then they also say there's this principle of toleration, which is it's wrong to impose your culture's moral truths on another culture's moral truths, because look, everybody's got their own separate moral truths. Now, Williams thinks this view is stupid. Why is it stupid? Well, uh, look, on the one hand, it says morals are relative to each culture. And then on the other hand, it has this non-relativistic toleration principle, which says you shouldn't go around imposing your morals on other cultures. But if morals were truly relative to each culture, then if you lived in a culture that said, go impose your morals on other people, like for instance, colonial era British culture, then it would be right, it would be morally right for you to go and impose your culture on other people. That is what it means to say that each culture has its own moral truths. So it just doesn't make sense to say there should be this principle of toleration unless you give up the relativism. You could give up the relativism and say every culture should tolerate each other, but that would be an objective moral principle, not a relative moral principle. So that's this sort of obvious reason why vulgar relativism is bad. But Williams also thinks that his version of relativism is better than vulgar relativism for another reason. And this is what it says up here, the reason of moral reformers. So, uh, I don't know, we could read, well, first I'll explain it, then maybe I'll read the sentence, see if it makes sense. So think about how moral reform happens in a society. Imagine you live in a society that says, uh, you know, women should not be able to make their own decisions. Women should have decisions made for them by the head of the family, who is a man. And imagine you think, and, and this is like a moral judgment in the society, it's morally wrong for women to take charge of their lives. It's morally good for them to be uh, controlled by the men in their family. So, and imagine you say, this is morally bad. I'm living in the society, but I disagree. I think morally women and men should be equal. I think morally nobody should be controlled by others. When you do this, you're sort of expressing a hope for moral reform. You're saying, I don't agree with what my society says, and I think my society should change. I think society should be different. And notice what you're doing is you have there two systems of belief. You have the society-wide system of belief, 
which is oppressive to women. And then you have this system of belief that you're offering, the one you believe, which is not oppressive to women. And you're saying these, there is a real confrontation here. There is, these are both real options for me and for you, for everybody in this society. Society can change. There is a potential for change here. And most importantly, what you're saying is, my system of belief is better. I'm not just saying here are two options and, you know, pick your favorite. I'm saying mine should be preferred. Mine is morally better than the existing society. And Williams thinks for that to make sense, for your argument to make sense for anybody, for that to be true, and for us to account for societies which change on the basis of these sorts of arguments, we can't be relativists about these two systems of belief. We can't say, oh, they're just both equally good, because then it wouldn't make sense to try to change society if they were both equally good. Why should we go with your system rather than the other system if they're both equally good? It can't make sense of the arguments you're giving for your system and against the existing system because you're using moral arguments and that implies that there's a sort of common currency there. There's a sort of objective standard we can judge these two systems against and yours does better. So to account for moral reform and to account for moral change in a society that happens in some sort of rational process, we have to give up relativism within societies or really, we have to give up relativism wherever we see moral reform, because moral reform is a form of progress. And if progress is true, relativism is false. There's some objective standard out there. And the better you do according to that standard, the more progress you make. So if you think moral progress is ever possible, you have to give up relativism in that context. And Williams thinks, yeah, you know, Lots of societies, it does seem like they make moral progress, so we shouldn't be relativists about everything in morality, which is what the vulgar relativist wants. But, you know, have we made moral progress compared to the Bronze Age Greek moral system? Williams just said, that, that, that makes no sense. Like, there's, a, there's two completely different contexts. There's just not any common way of judging between them. So relativism is true about those cases. And then the question is just sort of how widespread is it how widespread is relativism? Um, again, that's up to you. So I think I won't read this sentence, but uh, you can read it on your own time. So that's Williams's argument. Again, it's not really an argument so much as he's developing a framework and then saying it applies to morality, and you get to decide whether you agree or not. Uh, but that's the basic idea behind Williams. <laughs>